Welcome to the Now Center Library. I'm Gina Salter, your librarian and host, and Maggie Allen will be introducing our speakers. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce Rachel Wang, uh, who's a 2017 Canals Fellow at the Office of Aquaculture at NOAA. And our title is Inorganic Carbon Dynamics in a Marsh-Dominated Estuary. So Rachel received her master's degree in marine sciences at the University of Georgia. Her research focused on the carbon exchange in salt marsh estuaries. Before coming to the U.S., she had lived in China for 22 years and got her bachelor's degree in chemistry from the Ocean University of China. Prior to her Canals Fellowship, she worked with Georgia Sea Grant and the National Marine Sanctuaries on acoustically active animals living in the ocean and taught a marine biology summer class to middle school students. And a fun fact about Rachel, she enjoys meeting people from all over the world. Her first American football game experience was watching it with a group of international students and no one knew what was going on through the <laughs> entire game, but they still ended up having lots of fun. So please join me in welcoming Rachel away. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie, for the introduction. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about my master's research in inorganic carbon in a salt marsh estuary. Um, okay, first, let's do a little meditation. <laughs> um, seriously. So close your eyes and imagine um, this giant organism that doesn't have have a solid shape. It's almost transparent. It can go anywhere, fit into any space. It can change its shape. Okay. So it's it exchanges energy and substance with the environment by touching it. So you can hold hands if you want. <laughs> um, exchange some energy. Um, it's breathing and breathe out. It's breathing CO2, breathe out CO2. Breathing oxygen, breathe out oxygen. Okay, now you can open your eyes. So this giant organism is um, salt marsh estuary. That's how I visualize the estuary. And the surface is touched to exchange substance and energy is salt marsh. And um, salt marsh estuary, they are on the coastal. So I need to change my tone back to the top tone rather than the meditation. <laughs> it's doing that um, So. It's the coastal wetlands that's flooded by the tides twice a day. Um, here is a map of uh, Georgia coast. And all those light green color, some of them, they are salt marsh. And if you squint a little bit, you'll see those blue color lines. Those are the estuaries or tidal creeks. Um, so at high tide, the water flood onto the marsh. And at low tide, it grabs the uh, the byproducts of the decays and respiration to the water and then transport it to the coast ocean and to the atmosphere. Uh, so if you think salt marsh as a human body, the asteroids and the tidal creeks are like the circulation system uh, and is driven by the heart, which is the tide. Why salt marsh is important is we know it's a uh, very efficient primary producer. It fixes a lot of carbons into its biomass and also bury it to the soil. And it's critical habitat for a lot of species, uh, including those that are important to aquaculture and marine fisheries. And it's such a small area compared to the global ocean, um, but it contributes disproportionately large of carbon to the global carbon budget. So my research will focus on the carbon budget. So this is this is the cross section of cross section view of the marsh estuary. I made this with PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you're looking at half of the channel. So this is the channel full of water, and this is the bank, marsh bank, and this is the marsh. So at low tide. So at low tide, the water stays in the channel. And at high tide, the same water mass goes on upstream and goes on to the marsh. And at low tide, it comes back to the channel again. So onto the marsh, come back to the channel, onto the marsh, come back to the channel. It's the same water mass uh, that we're studying as a, our control volume. So my 
research. So we all know salt marsh uh, fix a lot of carbon and their primary producers, but a lot of time they're submerged under the water. So my research focused on this water part. We want to know how much CO2 is exchanged through the water surface, uh, how much is exchanged, how much CO2 is exchanged through the uh, estuary channel to the coastal ocean, and how much of these is contributed by the inundating marsh, and what is the metabolism for the entire aquatic ecosystem. The approach that we use is diurnal open water approach. What does that really mean is, now I want you to imagine the estuary as a box, not a giant cool organism, or the box. So it's a black box. Whatever comes in should be equal to whatever goes out, and also the inner, inner source, like the production and consumption. So for this situation, the change of dissolved inorganic carbon concentration is caused by the air water flux, the longitudinal mixing with the adjacent water mass, and then the inner source metabolism or production and consumption that happens in the water column. It also happens uh, on the salt marsh sediments, but transported to the water. So, and at the end, I want to kind of tease out this part, this metabolism, metabolism or carbon that is contributed by uh, marsh inundation. So we want to quantify the lateral transport of carbon from the marsh platform. To measure the metabolism, we use this diurnal approach, which means we go on the field on the sunrise, uh, measure the CO2, and then do it again at sunset. So the change between sunrise and sunset will be net day production. That includes both GPP gross primary production and respiration. And then we do that again for the next sunrise. And then you have this sunset to sunrise interval, which is nighttime, and that's only respiration. Then we can get a res respiration rate. And then we assume the night respiration will be the same during the daytime, and then we can calculate the GPP. And for this talk, you're going to hear dissolving organic carbon, or DIC, or PCO2, which means uh, partial pressure of CO2. There are different forms of CO2, but you can think of them as CO2 in general for the purpose of today's talk. So the study side, we, we did the study at uh, Duping River on Seplo Island. Uh, whoever came up with the name of Duping River does not know the definition of a river. It's not really a river. It's, it has no fresh water input. Um, it's basically a tidal creek. And the marsh densi density increased upstream. Um, in order to capture the spatial variation, we did the sampling at 12 different stations. The river is 12 kilometers long, so we break them down into 12 segments. And we did the transect at sunrise, sunset, and the following sunrise in order to capture the diurnal change. And we did it on um, four different seasons. And in order to tease out the marsh contribution, we did an anchoring sampling at the small tidal creek by the estuary. Uh, we sampled the CO2 for the entire tidal cycle in order to see how much carbon is coming out from the marsh. And then we scaled up this tidal creek uh, measurements to the entire duping. To give you an idea of how um, the CO2 distribute across the 12 kilometer long dupling is increased from the mouth of the dupling upstream and has a very high jump at the very last one, one kilometer stretch. Um, so it can go, in the summertime, it can go up to 8,000 ppm. What does that mean? So the CO2 in the atmosphere is 400 ppm whereas in the Dukin River is 8,000, so it's releasing a lot of CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, and you will see the blue and green lines are the sunrise level, and sunset level is in the red line. It makes sense in the sense that it's lower because you have the whole day of photosynthesis and GPP happening, and that consumes CO2. So next, I'm going to show you how we um, 
what, what are the numbers for each of these arrows. Uh, let's get start from, from the air water exchange. So for the entire fourth season, um, Zhuping River has been releasing CO2 to the atmosphere and is strongest <coughs> in August in the summertime and weakest in February. And we integrate through the whole year and through the entire Jupiter, the entire asteroid release about 74 millimoles per year of carbon to the atmosphere, of which about 2.221 million moles, about one third of it, is contributed by the surface water that's right above the inundated marsh. So, so as, as the Jupiter is releasing CO2 up to the atmosphere, it also exporting CO2 to the coast ocean. So it's been exporting CO2 through the, through the whole, whole year, and uh, in total it is released about 30 millimoles CO2 to the coast ocean. So we calculate the air water exchange and we calculate the we, we have the longitudinal mixing and we have the change of concentration DIC and then we can calculate the metabolism. So for the metabolism oops so the red line here is respiration along the duping from the mouth of the duping zero kilometer to the upstream and green line is the GPP growth primary production. As you see, both GPP and R increase upstreams and have a very big jump at the very last station, very last kilometer, because the marsh density is very high there. You have more interaction with the marsh, so you have more metabolism going on. At NEP, which is the balance of GPP and R, is always positive in the unit of CO2. That means that the net is releasing CO2 is the net heterotrophic. And then we integrate the, through the entire Dupin, we have the total metabolism for Dupin River for each season. Uh, in August, the respiration is the highest uh, and G, in red color, and GPP is the green color, is high in summer and in the fall. Uh, NEP, which is the blue color, is always uh, net heterotrophic. It's releasing, it's the net source of CO2. So everything I just talked about, we measure it in the unit of CO2. But we actually also did the exact same thing for oxygen. So we measured all the metabolism with oxygen. Why do we do that? Because oxygen is so much easier to measure than CO2. So previously, people have been using oxygen measured uh, metabolism and converted to carbon with a ratio about 1 to 1. So the ratio sometimes is uh, respiratory quotient or photosynthetic quotient. Uh, so we want to know what is what is that ratio is like in the salt marsh estuaries. So we did the whole study in both CO2 and oxygen. And we find out the respira respiratory quotient is the mean respiratory quotient is about 1.2. So that means more CO2 is produced than oxygen consumed in respiration which makes sense because we know salt marsh is anaerobic habitat, so there are a lot of uh, respiration going on that does not consume oxygen, but, but they release CO2, such as sulfate reduction. And the photosynthetic quotient is also is lower than one, which also can be explained by the anoxygenic photosynthesis, which is um, adopted by the cyanobacteria response to the high level of the sulfur on the sediment. So they can do photosynthesis uh, consuming CO2 but not necessarily releasing oxygen. So that could be one of the explanations for that. So now we have air water exchange, we have longitudinal mixing with the coastal ocean, and we quantify the metabolism of the entire aquatic ecosystem. Uh, the two arrows that has now been lighting up is the lateral transport from the marsh and what is happening, what is the metabolism on the marsh. In order to quantify 
the lateral transport. Uh, so we here at the, the blue bar, the sorry, purple bar, are the lateral transport from the marsh to the estuary. Uh, you can see three out of five months, five three out of five months when we go to measuring, when we go to measure of uh, the lateral the marsh is actually exporting CO2 to the estuary. And if you correct the lateral transport with the air water flux, we can get an idea of the metabolism happens on the over the inundated marsh and it is um, not heterotrophic. So sorry it's not showing here. So the water coming from salt marsh from the salt marsh is also net heterotrophic and contributes to the total net heterotrophy uh, for the entire system. So now we have the very last piece of puzzle for the entire picture. Um, so the take home message is the aquatic system, the salt marsh estuary is the source of CO2 to the atmosphere and to the coast ocean and a portion of this CO2 source is coming from the metabolism happening on the marsh sediments. So at last, I want to thank my committee members, my co-authors, and everyone who helped me. Uh, and that's me with my advisor in the back and technician. That was a very happy sunny day. Uh, but there's also days like that. It was raining and lightning, and we're sitting on a metal boat for 12 hours. Uh, it was fun. <laughs> and my friend drove to that um, my Facebook picture for you. Um, that's it. So if you want to read my paper, uh, go to this link and uh, I'm open to questions and comments. Yeah, so the question is, are there other stu studies that similar to the Dupin study, but also on other part of the salt marsh? So the answer is yes, there are. And in my publication, I compared uh, their numbers with mine. So I would say most of them, uh, most of the studies indicating that the salt marsh estuaries is a source of CO2 to the adjacent. Um, do you know how much spatial variability there is in these systems? I mean, you sampled at 12 different points, or, and we looked at one tidal channel. Is that representative of everywhere? Yeah, so the question is uh, how much variability across the entire uh, system. I sampled across, so it, there are variabilities there, apparently. Uh, that's why for the Dupin River, we break them down into 12 segments um, in order to capture that spatial vari variability. And you see that big jump at the very last stretch of the, of the river. You see the CO2 change uh, dramatically. And also, we believe there is variability among the marsh too, but we, um, we only measured one part of the marsh and scaled it up for the entire marsh system. Um, it would be really nice if we can do multiple spot, uh, but maybe another graduate student. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and there's another thing that's really tricky was um, the water. You know, the water. It's hard to define the boundaries between the water and the marsh. And you measure the water, but the the, the signals in the water also reflects the signals in the marsh because they have interactions. And these interactions are not constant. It's not the, 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 today it could be a lot of area, tomorrow it could be smaller area. So how do you actually define, if you want to scale up points to the whole area, how do you define that area? So that's a very hard question for us to answer. We use high mean water level. Um, 
but I think the best solution would be uh, modelers. So you have you can measure that area for the entire year and then integrate and have the data for the entire year and then integrate the DIC with the area um, for the entire year. So I think that would be really ideally. Um, someone would want to do a study there. That'd be really great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I have a two-part question. And I guess I'll start with a disclaimer that I did research on the same island as, as Rachel, so I have a little bit similar with the team down there. Um, I was wondering uh, if you use any data from this a nearby flux tower. Um, I know you're taking similar measurements from the that you integrated it with any of the air measurements that were going on. And the second question is, is it the final mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'll answer the second one first because that's easier. Um, I didn't see any alligators, but I heard rumors. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, I, yeah, I heard rumors. I think from my advisor, he was there one time. I wish I was there one time, and he was trying to find the alligators. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was uh, and the <laughs> so the first question is um, there is a the, there is a flux tower on on the location where I measure the DIC water. The flux tower measures the vertical exchange of CO2 uh, directly above the salt marsh. So I'm looking at the lateral transport, and the flux tower is looking at the vertical transport. So yes, there is a study there. Um, for my for this for this. Paper I did not integrate their measurements because when I write this paper they're not done yet. I don't have the data. I'm not sure if that their their data has come out yet or not. Um, but I think eventually the eventually the goal is to compare my lateral transport with their vertical exchange and to see how the entire picture is. Um, would your research have any? management implications, or how do you and your team hope that it affects environmental management? Yeah, I had never thought about when I was in school, um, but then I started the fellowship. That's something I constantly uh, keep thinking. And then I realized it's harder to answer uh, when you know about this research in a very, you know, a lot of details. It's easier for me to answer, like, you know, fishery or all mm -hmm. um, so I would think um, it's related to one blue carbon, which is the carbon that's been permanently stored in the soil by the salt marsh. Uh, if, but if you look at the big picture, that amount of carbon that's been buried in the uh, in the soil, actually, the amount is small, much smaller compared to the lateral transport or the vertical transport. However, that's on a different time scale. What I'm looking at is a very short time carbon exchange, whereas Carbon Bureau is happens in a long time and it's accumulation. So over a very long time, that part of carbon could be really uh, important. So and also, we've been estimating the global um, the capability of ocean to absorbing the CO2 from the atmosphere, but actually the coastal ocean is actually very different than the open ocean. So my study can help understand, have better resolution on the global ocean carbon death budget. Okay, great. Thank you so much.